Clear prop. Star 73 is changing number two, following twin traffic, three mile final. There's nothing to do. One trolley Bravo makes for it in runway 25, going uh, four mile final. This is Behind the Prop with United Flight Systems owner and licensed pilot Bobby Doss and his co host, major airline captain and designated pilot examiner Wally Mulhern. Now let's go Behind the Prop. What's up, Wally? Hey, Bobby, how are you? I am fantastic. This week, uh, we're going to talk about a couple things, but the biggest part of the conversation is going to be about special VFR. I think that uh, we all hear about it. We all understand it when we probably take a check ride or a written exam. We understand the rules behind it, but I personally didn't really know how to implement it uh, from a practicality standpoint and how I would use it um, probably 30 days after my check ride. And um this is a time of year, specifically in Houston, Texas, that um, it could become a friend of ours to maybe uh, get out of the get out of the field that we're in today and uh, off into the practice area and other places. So uh, we're going to talk about a special VFR, and then we're going to talk a little bit about call signs. I think you had a few things happen on check rides recently that uh, we wanted to share with the listeners and make sure they knew what we were thinking about as it relates to call signs. Yeah. Yeah, just getting into uh, special VFR. Um, basically, it's it's a way to skirt the rules a little bit, if if you will. I, I don't know if that's the right way to say that or not, but um, it is uh, it is legal. So I guess you're not really skirting the rules. But basic basic VFR is a thousand and three. Um, you know, in my flying career, I think I've used special VFR one time. And um, I don't really remember the circumstances, but um, I believe it was probably a situation where we taxied out and, uh, you know, the weather was uh, maybe 3,000 and and three miles visibility. And we got to the end of the runway and they're calling the visibility two and a half miles. The field just went IFR, state your intentions is what we got from Tower. And we wanted to um, get out in the practice area. Uh, it was just a, uh, you know, a condition that we believed was kind of a transient condition. There might be, a, maybe there was a fire and smoke had moved in and limited visibility a little bit. So I asked for a special VFR. We were granted it and we were able to leave the airport. Um, probably not something that you should um, uh, use regularly unless um, I mean there could be situations where you might be a, a pipeline patrol pilot and you're flying down at 500 feet anyway and um, the weather is is you know a thousand broken um, that might uh, might be a situation where you can get out of, of the airport that you're uh, taking off from um, a special VFR is something that student pilots are not authorized to use. So you student pilots, um, this is just something that, that's down the road for you when you get your private pilot certificate. But, um, uh, you know, it's not something you should use. And I don't, I don't feel, you know, and this is my opinion, I don't feel like special VFR is something that you should really count on or plan on it's it's kind of a little tool that you have uh, kind of an emergency plan a contingency plan yeah i think that uh the case where i may use it would be where i'm on the field i'm about to take off maybe i'm going to austin to pick up my daughter it's vfr the whole way there um it's in the morning maybe the dew point temperature pretty close and as the temperature starts to change, maybe maybe the visibility gets a little less or the ceiling gets a little less, and I'm at the end of the runway, and they tell me the airport goes IFR. While I'm an IFR-rated pilot and current pilot, I could I could go back and file a flight plan, but that's going to take me a bunch of time. They're not going to give it to me right there at the end of the runway if I ask them for it. But what I do have in my disposal, as you said, more like a, a tool in your tool bag, is to say, hey... Um, could I be cleared out special VFR? And they're going to give that to me. I'm assuming 99.9% of the time. Yeah. And then I'm going to get, I'm going to get out on in the air and probably back to those VFR conditions really, really quick. Right. Um, and then if I need to maybe get a pop-up clearance or something else. Um, but it's something that I don't know that I would use if I wasn't an instrument pilot, your, 
you're you are flirting with instrument conditions, obviously. Yeah, because uh, it's no longer VFR, and all the all the things that I think about as it relates to my personal minimums with instrument stuff is what I would be thinking about with special VFR too. What if I had an engine problem and I had this low visibility? Well, I'd want to make sure I could get back to the airport for sure. Um, again, being able to see the ground. So if it's a uh, thousand feet, I'd probably feel comfortable with that because I could scoot around here at 800 feet and be safe. There's nothing that I'm going to hit. Um, but if it was less than that, I would not, I would not take off for sure. Special VFR. And I'd have to have a really good idea, almost like you said, smoke blowing through that it was going to be temporary or that I was only going to be in it for seconds. Right. Um, and not something for an extended period of time for sure. Because I, I, I'm assuming I wouldn't set up my equipment like I would for an IFR flight. I wouldn't have everything programmed the way I'd want it to be programmed. This would be a, uh, this would be a tool to get me to to get get airborne and get on the road, quote unquote, on the road to where I wanted to go. Um, the it's far of, it's, talk, it's it's all in ninety one one fifty seven is where this stuff's at, and then there's some stuff in the aim as well, maybe a condensed version in the aim under four dash four dash six. But there's a lot more rules to it than what we've just talked about from a standpoint of being at the end of the runway. Um, Obviously, the airports have to support it or have to approve it, right? So right. I do have to get the clearance from ATC. If I'm not at a towered airport, I would have to call Flight Service Center and ask them to help me get to, to get that clearance from ATC. They might they can't give it themselves, but they'll help me with ATC. Right. Uh, I might call Center myself on the radio and ask for it or on the phone. But I'm going to have to have that from air traffic control. And then we live in Houston. There's a few airports that don't allow it, right? So if you look in the appendix D of 91, there is some air, there's some clear rules where it's not uh, allowed, and one of those happens to be Bush Intercontinental Airport. Um, so I can't I can't request special VFR in and out of there. That's appendix D section three, and it clearly calls out that airport. Um, what about night, Wally? What about the rules as it relates to special VFR at night? Yeah, special VFR at night, you have to be instrument rated to uh, request it. And again, a special VFR is not something that air traffic control is going to offer. It is specifically something that you as the pilot will have to request. Uh, but special VFR at night, you are required to have an in instrument rating to do that. That... Um, I would I would have to think long and hard about uh, special VFR at night. I, I I just I think I don't under you know I don't know the the advantages of that. I I think if it were that case, um, I would I would file I would just file IFR right then. And you know now with with the technology that most of us have at our disposal. Um, you know, it's it's really not even a case probably of going back. I mean, you could probably file using your EFB if you have connectivity. Um, you could probably file or, or use your, your phone and file uh, fairly easily. Um, but um, I, I would I would think really long and hard about filing for uh, asking for special VFR at night. Yeah, the only reason I could possibly imagine doing it at night. Um would would just to be moving aircraft, but again, it would have to be very specific based on the current weather and the situations that I would be I would be fondly aware of. So, uh, I, a lot I, in preparing for this show, I did a lot of research. And while this this isn't a massive topic, it's one that I don't think we all understand very well. And a lot of this has to do with I think a lot of what I read had to do with coastal type airports, right? So something that we would would see uh, cold water, warm air, you know, fog or a small layer that was you think thing Monterey. If you've ever been to Monterey, you might not have three feet of visibility in some spots, but literally a mile away, it's crystal clear, right? It's yeah. So it's just the cold. It's the cold air over the water or the warm air over the water that that is creating that fog. Now I'm not saying I'd take off in fog, of course, but there may be some small uh, marine layer that right. is at a thousand feet that I know as soon as I get four hundred four mile four miles from the airport that it's going to be the best VFR conditions in the world. 
Um, and I might, I might take that on at night, but it would be very specific because I, I knew that it was going to be crystal clear. It was not something that I would take any chances on if there were snow showers in the area and I thought I was going to try and dodge snow showers at night. Um, that just makes absolutely no sense because we're talking freezing and visibility and everything else that bad you don't want in a, right. in a tin, tin can <laughs> airplane that we might be flying around here. Yeah. Um, you said you've only used it once. I've never used it. And I, again, I can only think of a few circumstances where I might use it. Um, I know that, uh, my chiefs used it a couple times on call it, uh, 1500 foot days where he needed a test flying aircraft that I was thinking about buying. He did a couple laps in the pattern in that. Um, and I don't see any risk or harm in, in doing that on a benign day that just had a 14, 1500 foot ceiling. You're not going to go fly the pattern like that on a regular basis, but to get a couple laps in in a plane that you're wanting to buy, I don't see the harm in that. Um, interesting. What, interested in understanding if our listeners have ever used Special VFR in those circumstances. If you have a story to tell us where it went well, maybe where it didn't go so well, uh, or a Special VFR clearance turned quickly into an IFR clearance, shoot us a note uh, either via social media or to our email addresses, Bobby at BehindTheProp.com or Wally at BehindTheProp.com and let us know your special VFR situation and story. Uh, make sure you are being safe when you take this stuff on because uh, that could turn dangerous really, really quick. So with that, Wally, let's jump into our call sign conversation. You've uh, had some interesting rides lately, I'll say, from a check ride perspective. Talk, let's talk a little bit about call signs and some guidance that we want to share. Yeah, uh, th this is this has turned into a crusade of mine, if you will. A um, little bit of a pet peeve of mine. Uh, one one thing that I have noticed, especially at, at this airport, is um, and and a lot of it is is prompted by ATC here, and it it actually um, it doesn't follow the guidance that's in the in the aim. Um, let's talk about the aim. What, what is the aim? The aim is non-regulatory in nature. So the aim is, is kind of uh, good to do stuff. You know, it's, it's stuff that, that you should do. It doesn't say you shall do it, but you should do it. Um, and one thing that I'm, I'm hearing a lot of is, is applicants when they use the call sign of the airplane, they'll say, November 1, 2, 3, Bravo, Charlie. Um, and, and, and what are we telling ATC by telling them our, our call sign is November 1, 2, 3, Bravo, Charlie. We're tell them, telling them that we are a U.S. registered airplane. That's all we're telling them. And, of course, the call sign. But um, if you read in the AIM, in um, Chapter 4, or actually Chapter 2, Radio Communication Phraseology 424 under aircraft call signs, and I'm quoting from the AIM. It says, civil aircraft pilots should state the aircraft type, model, or manufacturer's name, followed by the digits, letters of the registration number. When the aircraft manufacturer's name or model is stated, the prefix N is dropped, e.g. Aztec 2464 Alpha. So again, uh, this this says should. It doesn't say shall. It says should. So instead of November one two three Bravo Charlie, we should call ourselves Skylane one two three Bravo Charlie, or according to this, uh, you could you could call yourself Cessna one two three Bravo Charlie. Well, what does that do? It does a couple things. First of all, it lets other airplanes know what type of airplane we are. So if they're looking for us, they know what to look for. We, I think most of us know that a Skylane looks different from a Warrior. Okay, you're looking for a high-wing airplane versus a low-wing airplane. Uh, if you're talking ATC, it gives ATC a little bit of an idea of the performance capabilities of the airplane. So if he, if he hears uh, Skylane 123 Bravo Charlie call in and you're... you're 15 miles out and then Baron 456 Bravo Charlie calls in 
uh, the same distance out from a, from a different direction. He knows a baron goes faster than a skyline, and so he he's going to uh, sequence that baron in first, most likely. Um, but uh, you know, again, and especially at a non-controlled airport, when you're in the pattern at a non-controlled airport and you're reporting your position, November one, two, three, Bravo Charlie on a left downwind runway three six. Uh, you know, people looking for airplanes, they, they, they see an airplane up there and they think it's you and it might not be you. So, uh, you know, if you can say the aircraft type, uh, it just helps everybody else. And I mean, that's basically what the aim says to do. And, um, the other thing is, you know, the more that we can say on the radio with less, the better. Um, and so, when you go into another airport uh, and you use November 123 Bravo Charlie, probably the first one of the first things air traffic control at that other airport is going to say, state your aircraft type. Um, so they're going so you just you're just causing a little bit more chatter on the radio that just really doesn't need to be there. Yeah, the uh I think early on, I remember sitting in the cockpit trying to take all this stuff in and my instructor saying, we're a Skyhawk. And looking back now, knowing what I know now, that I don't remember what a Sky, I didn't know what a Skyhawk was. And and it seems silly because everyone now knows what, everyone listening to this show probably knows what a Skyhawk is, but I didn't know what a Skyhawk was. And I kept, you know, we changed tail numbers and I would say, are we still in a Skyhawk? Because I'm not really sure, but... Of course, all the 172s, if you say Skyhawk, that's probably going to put you in the same bucket. And they all were branded. I think they all are branded Skyhawk. But the, I fly a Skylane now, so I'm used to saying Skylane 149 or two uniform as I as I go my, by my flying. And it's a big difference. You know, you're talking 40 knots probably over the ground that, that you're doing different speeds. If you're a Skylane coming up behind a – and they might see your airspeeds on the radar, but – not every airport has radar, and they might not be able to see your overtake. But um, I think it's it's important now for me to say Skyline versus Cessna. I would also say I've had the opportunity to fly some bigger, faster jets and twin-engine aircraft. Uh, there are Cessna jets, so Cessna by itself doesn't necessarily articulate it. So uh, you don't have to be a, a knower of all models and types, but... Um, when we had ATC on here, they told us they have a little cheat sheet that they can plug in a, a type BE95 and that BE95 spits back some performance characteristics. That's what our twin is. And, you know, if you say that over the radio, a lot of people might not know what that is. And, uh, ATC has the ability to kind of get that quick profile pulled up. Know probably that the Ground speed average is 145, 150, and gives them some of that performance information they need to make some of those decisions. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I think one problem we have with, with this airport, David Wayne Hook's airport here in Houston, um, I think the controllers here, um, they, they know the airplanes. They know where the airplanes live, and they know – what type airplane they are. They, they can hear um, one, two, three, Bravo, Charlie, and they know what type airplane it is because they work that air, especially the flight school airplanes, they work the airplane several times in a given day. Sure. So they know it's a 172 or a Skyline or, or whatever it happens to be. So um, you can get away with it. We can get away with, uh, I don't know if, I don't know if saying bad technique is, is the right word. But, or the right phrase, but... Um, that says a little I, bit of complacency because yeah. we, we, we're just all used to each other. We yeah. all talk to each other all the time. It's not intended, but there's a little bit of expectation bias and all those things that go on. I did my night currency recently, and I, I've i been known to fly here for many, many years now in, in similar aircraft. And they actually, when I exited the runway, they asked where I parked. And I almost started laughing because they know where I park. And I don't know why they, all of a sudden, they... Uh, they and it was somebody I know that I've talked to thousands of times, but I think they were trying to crack some of that expectation bias and make sure that I might not be going to the real FBO or a different FBO. I was going back to United, so um, it was it was an interesting challenge from them to ask me where I was going because I know they know and 
I didn't have to tell them. They knew where I was headed, right? Right. That That's a for sure thing. Um, I think we had uh, Pat on a long time ago, and you mentioned it's not even hinted somewhere, but if there's something else distinguishing that you could tell in a pattern to people, it would be informative. To you know, he used to have a, a yellow, a bright yellow 150 that he flew for the AOPA, and it, he called it Woodstock. And he would say, if he was in the pattern, he would say yellow Cessna, um, and that's helpful because what if there are five aircraft in the pattern? And he wanted to make sure that they didn't get him confused if he was on final, that they saw him as the yellow Cessna, right? And uh, I think you'd have to have something pretty distinguishing like that. Yeah. But uh, it, it it would help. You would got to think it's going to help if you're in close proximity with one another. Yeah, I, I agree. I you you I begin to hear um, some people using that blue skyhawk um, one two three Bravo Charlie left downwind. Um, again, I I haven't seen this written anywhere, but I I don't think anybody um if anybody thinks it's a bad idea i'd i'd be interested to hear your take on it um the the bottom line is we just want to communicate uh, especially at a non-controlled airport we want to communicate with each other and um uh, uh you know make ourselves make ourselves seen yeah and i we've talked about this section before uh, um but I love the part at the very end of this section, 4-2-4 in the aim. It's actually section C. It talks about student pilots radio identification. And uh, when we're driving in cars, there's normally a big yellow sticker on the back that says student driver. But in the aircraft that we fly, there is no big sticker. But it is very, very helpful for ATC, for other aircraft, we all want to help you be successful when you're learning how to fly, and it is to your huge advantage to call out that you are a student pilot. And the AIM recommends that you say something to the effect of Daytona Tower Fleet Wing 1234 Student Pilot. And uh, that is going to designate that you are probably needing a little bit more help. You probably need things to come just a little slower. And you might need a little bit more time in the pattern. And if there's multiple runways, shoot, make sure you get the biggest one every time. Uh, it's only going to provide you a little bit of help and protection. So don't hesitate to use it. You don't have to use it on every every call. But I think once you designate it, the ATC guys and girls are supposed to pass it along as they hand you off if you're on flight following. Um, it's just going to help everybody help you be successful and it can't hurt, so uh, take advantage of that. As the owner of a flight school that owns 14 planes that are flown by students that don't have ratings, please, please say student pilot. We're all going to get help. Yeah, and, and when all else fails, just use plain language. I mean, it is perfectly fine to say, Hooks Tower 123 Bravo Charlie, I think I'm north of the airport. I'm confused. Can you help? That's perfectly, that's permissible. And you're going to hear everybody else on the radio, uh, probably, well, you're not going to hear them, but, but everybody's going to listen to that and they're going to go, okay, somebody's in trouble out there. We're all on the same page here. Yep. We, we really are. Everybody, everybody's going to be rooting for you and, and everybody's going to shut up and they're going to let you basically have that radio. No doubt for sure. So two topics today, a little shorter show than normal. But special VFR, uh, when in doubt, I would say skip it. But if you can use it and put it in your tool bag, uh, it's a good one to have at your disposal. Make sure your IFR current and proficient if you do it and take it on at nighttime. As it relates to call signs, please use your model number. Give some, give some indication to help pilots around you and ATC know what kind of performance characteristics you have. Uh, and omit that in uh, doesn't do anything but tell us that you're registered in the U.S. And as always, keep those things in mind. Fly safe and stay behind the prop. Thanks for checking out the Behind the Prop podcast. Be sure to click subscribe and check us out online at BehindTheProp.com. Behind the Prop is recorded in Houston, Texas. Creator and host is Bobby Doss. Co-host is Wally Mulhern. The show is for entertainment purposes only and is not meant to replace actual flight instruction. Thanks for listening and remember, fly safe. <laughs>